Greetings and welcome to part two of our Unit 4 lesson on Ancient China. This particular part of our chapter talks about the unification of China, specifically two more dynasties that made up the original ancient Chinese dynasties. So let's get started. First, we have the unification of China, which is our topic for this particular unit. Setting the stage, we are currently looking at, and we actually just finished talking about the Zai Dynasty, or sorry, the Zhao Dynasty, which lasted from about 1027 to 256 BC. There, the rulers reported uh, to the king who had the ultimate power. The local rulers reported to the king who had ultimate power. The local rulers are similar to what we call nobles. However, this particular dynasty was starting to be declining, and this period was known as the Warring State Period, where the nobles started uprising against the Zhao dynasty. And that's where we start our lesson. Ancient Chinese scholars. Born in 551 BC, Confucius grew up in a period of crisis and violence. This is during those warring periods which we just mentioned. And he was always one that wanted peace and believed that government could be restored around five basic principles of relationships. Those relationships are the rulers and their subject, the relationship between a father and a son, the relationship between a husband and his wife, the relationship of older brother and younger brother, and the relationship between friends and other friends. Confucius believed that education could transform a humbly born person into a gentleman, that it was education that would help people get out of the rut that they may be in and create a civilized society. Interesting fact though, Confucianism was never considered a religion. It was more of an ethical system the idea of people learning what's right and what's wrong and how to act in a civilized manner. So it's never really a religion. Ethical systems. Taoism, which is a religion, or it's more of a belief system, not so much a religion, was created by a guy named Lazai. He believed in a universal force called the Tao, meaning the way. Its search for knowledge contributed to the advancements of alchemy, astronomy, and medicine. Then you have another type of belief system or ethic system called the legalists. Legalists believed powerful governments should use law to end civil disobedience and that those who are disobedient should be harshly punished. They believe these ideas should be controlled as well as their actions being controlled. If you want to put this in kind of a modern day type of example, legalists you could compare to the Nazi regime of the 1930s and the 1940s where they believed the government had total power and should use that power to control and to control its people even if it meant through harsh punishments. Another ethical system is known as the I Ching. The I Ching, they were kind of different in the fact that they didn't look necessarily at what's, what's right and what's wrong who's got the power and who doesn't. But they basically believed that you could, based on a question, solve problems. The way they did this is they created a book. And this book uh, helped them to solve practical problems. To solve these problems, you would throw a set of special coins they would interpret the results of those coins and how they ended up on the ground and from those results make a prediction from the book on the result 
of that problem or how to solve that problem. It's kind of a, a game of chance in this particular case. And then there's the yin and the yang, which you can kind of see the symbol here on our images here. The yin and the yang represents the natural rhythm or balance of life. That there's a good side and a bad side. Such as, like there's a sun and a moon. Night and day. Identifies good with bad. The things are in balance. The yin is equivalent to like cold, dark, soft, and mysterious. Kind of like the negative side of things. Whereas the yang is the warm, bright, hard, and clear way of things. So if you look at the yin and the yang image, you see the white and the black. And the fact that they're swirling around each other means that they're coexisting. That they're working together. And the fact that you actually have the circles inside the opposite means that they have also have to coexist. That they have to work together in that balance in order for things to work out, in order for that balance to be successful. All right, let's get into the dynasty. We're going to look specifically at what's known as the Qin dynasty. It is spelled Q-I-N, but it's pronounced Qin. And if that doesn't look familiar, think of Qin as China. The name China comes from this Qin dynasty. In the 3rd century BC, the Qin dynasty replaced the Zhao dynasty. The first of these Qin rulers was Shi Hangdel, which means the first emperor. He actually took that name about 20 years af after he had already been ruling. I don't have a record of what his name was called before then, other than it was the Qin family. But he renamed himself to Shin Hangdul. When he was emperor, he stopped internal fighting and then focused on defeating the invaders and others who resisted his rules. So he would invade and take over areas to the north and to the south of his empire. He unfortunately distru distrusted his nobles, the rich people that lived in his kingdom. So because of that, he ordered them to live in the capital and then sent his own people around the empire to control and create these administrative districts around the country. He put his own people in charge so that these districts would be ruled how he wants them to be governed. Kind of a smart guy in that respect to put his own people there instead of others. To prevent criticism of his authority, he ordered the murders of hundreds of Confucian scholars and also required that books of Confucianism and Confucian thinkers and poems that disagreed with legalists be burnt. These books, that he did not want people going against him. And he felt that those that follow Confucianism went, went against his authority. And to stop that, get rid of the books, get rid of the scholars. And he did. You can actually see a, a depiction of that in the bottom image here of the burning of the books and the killing of the Confucius followers, kind of down here in the bottom corner, being thrown into pits and being burned up. Uh, additionally, this picture kind of shows the coins. Uh, one thing that this emperor is known for is using coin money for trade. So we have some images of Chinese currency. And if you want to get a picture of what the uh, leader looked like, got a picture of him here as well. Centralization, moving on. He created a system of 4,000 miles of road. He believed that you needed to have good trade routes 
and transportation for those trade routes. So he created this system of roads. He also standardized law, currency, weights and measures for the entire country. This allowed for a standardization so that no matter where you were in the country, everybody was working by the same set of rules, by the same set of expectations. What weighed one pound in the north weighed one pound in the south. They used the same type of system throughout the entire country to make it organized and everybody on the same page. It even got to the point where he created standards for how wide a cart could be for transportation. Because if the roads are only so wide, the cart can only be so wide. So he was very strict upon these standards and the expectations that he had of his citizens and how they were to be ruled. These projects that he had increased farm productions massively, create a lot of food, a lot of opportunities for trade. These trade opportunities created a new class of merchants. So even though it was very harsh, the trade was making some people rich. And these new rich nobles, or you could call them rich citizens, became a new class of merchants. However, despite the fact that people were making money, that there was all these advancements in roads and, and farming and all these weights and measures, despite all that, the government was still harsh, taxed his people really high, and all these things made him very unpopular among the citizens. The Qin Dynasty is also known for beginning the construction of what we today call the Great Wall of China. The Zhao rulers actually began the construction. They were small walls, not very big, obviously to discourage attacks by the nomads. But it was Xu Hengdao that sent poor citizens to the wall to build a much larger wall, to the, to the effect that it spanned over halfway across the country. This sucker was huge. In the end, the Qin dynasty would fail. After Xin Haodu's death, his son took over and was found to be just as cruel as his father. However, he was a bad leader. It didn't take long, only about two years of his leadership, that the peasants rebelled, paving the way for the Han dynasty around 202 BC which is where we'll get into our next lesson. Now let's go back. This was the location where they found this, uh, this leader's burial site. We've got all these statues. These are called terracotta, terracotta statues. Okay. He built all of these statues to protect him after his death. National Geographic actually has an awesome article about this, but he built hundreds and thousands of different statues, all of them different, with horses and chariots and warriors and regular everyday peasants lined up protecting him after his death. And with that, this is the end of our second set of notes for our fourth unit. I hope you found it insightful. If you do have any questions, please let Mr. Vincent know. This does go with worksheet number four, sorry, worksheet number five in your list of assignments. Hope you got something out of it.